we can tell all the topics change in 1 Corinthians by the phrase, now concerning. Chapter 7, verse 1, now concerning the things about which you wrote. They wrote him a letter and asked him questions. Chapter 7, 25, now concerning the single women. That was about families getting married in those days of persecution. Chapter 8, verse 4, now concerning meat in the marketplace. That's because in those days the pagans would pray over the animals before they'd butcher them. But now we are leaving 1 Corinthians 11, which was about communion. And we're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, now concerning spiritual gifts. Uh, charismata, get charismatic from it. Now concerning spiritual gifts. And if you will come with me to 1 Corinthians 12, what we're going to do today is we're going to do uh, topic by topic, not so much verse by verse. We'll come back later and go verse by verse through it. But right now, uh, topic. Uh, let's read 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. Unaware would be ignorant. I always think it's kind of funny because the original word is related to agnostic. So I do not want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. The next three chapters in 1 Corinthians are about spiritual gifts. Chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14. Now we'll remember 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and that's the love chapter. The virtues of faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love, and that's the love chapter, but it's still about spiritual gifts because what he's arguing for is if you have abilities but don't love other people, quote, I am nothing. So even though 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter, it's still about spiritual gifts being used in love and care about other people. So uh, all of uh, chapter 12, 13, and 14, all of this ahead is about spiritual gifts. Uh, the Corinthians had some problems with spiritual gifts. They're coming in chapter 14. Uh, they would say that you only can have two or three people speak in tongues. Tongues means languages, by the way. Not so much gibberish, but languages. And the most you could have is two or three people speak a foreign language in the church. Then there had to be an interpreter or else keep silent. And he will tell them God is not the author of confusion. Church service shouldn't be confusing, but of order. We will get to that in a few weeks, but I would like to say I think there's more confusion about spiritual gifts now in our time than there was when they wrote 1 Corinthians. And he does not want us to be ignorant about it. So back to uh, the way we're going to do this. We'll look at it topically, either make a statement or have a question and answer. And I guess I will say a statement. Every believer has a spiritual gift. Every single person that trusts in Jesus as Savior has a spiritual gift. And uh, if you will look at 1 Corinthians 12, we'll look at verse 7 and verse 11. Verse 7, to each one of us is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So how many? Each one. Verse 11. But one of the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. And uh, we had for our scripture reading, 1 Peter 4.10, which is a parallel. As each one has received a spiritual gift, uh, employ it in the service to God. So how many people have spiritual gifts in the Bible? Well, verse 7 and verse 11 and 1 Peter 4, every single person has a spiritual gift that's a believer. I always think of a couple in our church in Pennsylvania. They say they had no spiritual gifts. Well, they certainly did. 
But they say they did not. But the Bible says they did. I kept telling them, the Bible says you do. And they were about the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. We're talking about an older generation, but he was a World War II vet, got shot down in an airplane, was in a hospital, and he was making crosses out of airplane propellers, cutting them into crosses. I have one of them back in my desk. I kept it so long, I thought, aren't too many crosses made out of airplane propellers from a World War II vet? And they were really, really nice, uh, always encouraging people, always showing mercy, uh, almost like we never did this, but here's the key to our house. We're going away on vacation. You can take anything you want out of it, take anything out of the freezer, take anything out of the closet. If you want to have friends come to Pennsylvania, you, they can use our house while we're gone. Here's our key. And these are the people that tell me they had no spiritual gift. Very, very encouraging. Very, very merciful to anybody in trouble. And even the Bible gives a spiritual gift of helps. Every believer has a spiritual gift. Next topic, they're related. When does it begin? Well, they're related. If every person that trusts in Jesus has a spiritual gift, then something must, at least in germ form or in seed form, it must start right when they trust in Jesus. Because if every believer has a spiritual gift, which the Bible clearly teaches, then people who have only been saved for 10 minutes have a spiritual gift, at least starting. May not say it's fully developed, but at least starting. So a person that was saved this year or this week or in the last five minutes, if everybody has a spiritual gift, then it starts at the time they become believers. I will give a related topic. How many people have the Holy Spirit? Here's where churches disagree, but I don't know why. Everybody that's a believer has the Holy Spirit. I don't know why they disagree on that. Uh, looking ahead to verse 13, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, uh, Jews or Gentiles, whether slaves or free, we're all made to drink of one spirit. Baptized would mean that the Holy Spirit is around, uh, indwelling on the inside, made to drink. How many? Everybody. Close of verse 13, we were all made to have the Holy Spirit on the inside. All of us have him on the inside. Uh, Jesus said the same thing in John chapter 7. He's uh, talking about it's a future to his time, but he said that everyone who believes in him will have the Holy Spirit. So there are Bible verses that are kind of clear that everybody who is a believer has the Holy Spirit, and yet there are are going to be church services today where they're trying to get the Holy Spirit for believers. One of the mix-ups is sometimes you can use an Old Testament verse. You can use an Old Testament verse where somebody has the Holy Spirit and somebody does not. But the Holy Spirit's ministry changed totally at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And if you use Acts chapter 2 and following... Everyone who is a believer already has the Holy Spirit. Here again is verse 13. Here again is uh, John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. So how many have gifts? Every believer, therefore, must be at the time of salvation, at least in uh, beginning form, have a gift. And... Uh, uh, what is the relationship between spiritual gifts and the Holy Spirit? Every single believer has the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, what is the relationship between natural abilities and spiritual gifts? Let me say that again. Sometimes you know, unsafe people have very good abilities. What is the relationship between that and spiritual gifts? I don't think the Bible teaches one way or the other. I would think I would allow for both. That an unsafe person that has uh, good abilities that might be transformed into doing something for Jesus, might be transformed into spiritual gifts. 
Uh, let me pick up C.S. Lewis. It's getting kind of old, but C.S. Lewis uh, uh, taught, uh, well, fiction and writing. And he wrote uh, Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe and wrote Chronicles of Narnia. And he wrote Screwtape Letters, which is a really funny book because Screwtape Letters is a fiction book about an uncle demon writing a nephew demon telling him how to get the Christians. So in a C.S. Lewis could teach and write before he was a believer. But then when he became a believer, his teaching and writing were turned into a spiritual gift. So I think sometimes spiritual gifts are natural abilities that are then turned to be used for Jesus. But I would also allow that a spiritual gift might be a brand new thing. The person never did it when they were an unsaved person. The person never did it when they were a non-Christian. And now that they've trusted in Jesus as Savior, they have brand new interests and develop brand new abilities. So uh, every believer has one or more spiritual gifts. Therefore, it must start at the time of salvation, even if it's just the beginning and needs to develop. Uh, it could be something that a person already can do, and then it becomes a spiritual gift, or it could be something brand new that they've never done before, and uh, they now like it. Next, uh, what is the purpose for spiritual gifts? And we've already kind of uh, looked at that. Uh, verse 7 I emphasize in verse 7 each one, but now I'd like to emphasize for the common good. The purpose for a spiritual ability or a spiritual gift is for the common good. Right there in verse 7. And then we also, for our scripture reading, get 1 Peter 4.10 to employ the spiritual gift serving one another. So what is the purpose of the spiritual gift? It's uh, to help other people. We also have to say that everything we do in life is to glorify Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the verses are for the common good. The verses are employed to serve one another. The verses are to help other people. But in this unselfish effort of using our spiritual abilities, is to exalt the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's uh, everything. Ephesians 3.21, To Him be the glory in the church for all generations forever and ever. Romans 11.36, For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. So, why would we have spiritual gifts? To help other people for the common good. Also to exalt and promote and give attention to God and exalt him as much as we can. I do want to add that a uh, spiritual gift is not to get something for self out of it. That's not the purpose. However, that it will be the result. There is a difference between purpose and result. In all of life, there's a difference between purpose and result. And in thinking of Bible topics, there's a difference between purpose and result. God gives Christians spiritual gifts, and it's not to exalt self. That's not the purpose of it. On the other hand, he keeps track of everything we do. And the result will be rewards for him. Uh, Hebrews 6.10 for God is not unjust to forget your works and the love which you have shown in ministering to his saints. In other words, the purpose of a spiritual gift is not to get a reward, but that will be the result because God will do it. God will take care of it. It's not really our mindset. Our mindset in working for God is, number one, to exalt him, and number two, for the common good, to help other people. Now we continue a little bit more. How do we know our spiritual gifts? How do we know what God wants us to do? And I will come back to that, but I would like to say some of the spiritual gifts in the Bible are really should cross them off. That people today don't have those spiritual gifts. That would be the topic of the cessation of spiritual gifts. And uh, 
Books argue back and forth whether gifts can cease, but some of them clearly did. And the easiest one is the gift of apostleship. It's called the gift of apostleship in Ephesians chapter 4, but to be an apostle, one had to have seen the risen Lord. When the early church was meeting to replace Judas, Acts 1.22, the qualifications for an apostle, they have to be a witness with us of the risen Lord. In the past, we did 1 Corinthians 9. Paul said in verse 1, Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the risen Lord? Well, no one today has seen the risen Lord. No one today is 2,000 years old. So there is no one who is an apostle. And the gift of apostleship, there is an example of one that stopped. Correctly defined, I would say prophecy stopped. Very often prophecy is defined as public speaking, but prophecy technically is God gives you a message which you are to give to all the people everywhere. Well, I think God might give a personal message to an individual, but I don't think God anymore is giving prophetic divine revelation equal to the Bible that all people, Christians everywhere need to obey it Ephesians 2.20 talks about the foundation of the church being the apostles and the prophets, the start. So as far as gifts ceasing, apostleship did cease. Truly being a prophet did cease. And uh, there aren't any apostles and there aren't any prophets. And I would argue if there are not any apostles, there shouldn't be any signs of an apostle. The signs of an apostle were the wonders and were the miracles. Someone in Bible days with a gift of healing, they would heal everybody that they attempted to heal. They wouldn't miss a single one. There'd be some that didn't have faith and Jesus would decline to heal them, but someone with a real gift of healing, they can, I use the illustration again, they can stand on our front lawn, point the veterans hospital and empty it. That would be the real gift of healing. It never ever fails. Likewise, in the Bible, the gift of tongues was actually languages. In uh, Acts chapter 2, the word is glossa. We get glossary from it. Translated, they could speak in all kinds of dialects on Pentecost. Here they are. The Parthians, the Medes, the Elamites, that would be Iranian or Persians. Or the Mesopotamians, that would be the Iraqis. Here are the Turks, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia. Next, Egypt. Next, Libya. Next, the Romans. Next, the Greeks. Next, the Arabs. They were all in Jerusalem for Pentecost. And when the apostles got the gift of tongues, they could talk in all these languages. The actual gift of tongues is the ability to speak a foreign language that one has never learned. I saw on TV one time, kind of a faith healer type, that had a Spanish translator. And I'm thinking, if you really had the biblical defined gifts of tongues, you could speak in Spanish. You would not need a translator. So that will be enough of this, but in the Bible, signs and wonders are tied to the apostles. They're signs of the apostles. Nobody around has seen the risen Lord. When we make a list of gifts that are being used today, I would do as many as possible that are named in the Bible, but I would leave out uh, languages. That's apostolic sign gift. I would leave out healers. If God wants to heal, then we, like James chapter 5, pray for the sick, and God can do it. But that's not the same thing as saying that there are healers. There aren't any apostles. There aren't any signs of the apostles. So when we make a list of all these things that could be gifts for today, some of them we could say probably not, but others we could say probably are, and they're in the Bible. But I think there are other things that now happen that were not in the Bible, like, say, electricians say 
gift of plumbing, the gift of building a building, the gift of paving the parking lot, and on and on and on. So if we were to say what gifts we have, I would, I would make it all kinds of things that can be used for ministry. How do we know our spiritual gifts? Romans chapter 12 is the closest. Do not be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will know the will of God. And then following the next chapter, it gives all the spiritual gifts. The next paragraph, excuse me, gives all the spiritual gifts. How would a person know their spiritual gifts? Well, don't be like the world. Try to become like Jesus. Go down in that direction. And then eventually one will know his or her spiritual gifts. If we don't know it yet, then we just stay in the direction of don't be like the world. Schematic. Don't be diagram like the world. That's the original word. Be transformed, metamorphosis. Uh, becoming like Jesus, becoming like Jesus, then eventually if we're going down that right highway, we'll know which lane to drive in. If we want to be unlike the world and more like Jesus, over time we will know what our spiritual gifts are. And if we don't know yet, then just keep going down that highway of wanting to be like Jesus and we will know. There's such a thing as neglecting one gift. 1 Timothy 4.14, don't neglect the gifts that are within you. There's such a thing as a person never really works at it. And then a person never really knows their spiritual gifts. To uh, conclude, how many people have spiritual gifts? Quite a few times, each one has spiritual gifts. When does a Christian get a spiritual gift? Well, if it's 100%, then they begin right at the beginning. Uh, does he, does, is a spiritual gift a natural ability? I think it can be. Or it can be something brand new. What is the purpose? To glorify God and for the common good. The result will be rewards. But that's not really the purpose. That's the result. But the purpose is for the common good and to glorify God. Uh, how would we know our spiritual gifts? I start out with a list of the Bible ones and add some other things that can be done for ministry and for helping with the church. And then I would go through and live for God in general, try to become like Jesus. And going in that direction, I think we'll feel a, this is the Romans 12, a measure of faith about a spiritual gift. I would translate it, we will feel a measure of confidence. This is what one should be doing. Uh, to give my example, if no one else would teach the kids, I would, but I don't have a great measure of confidence with that. So with me, Daphne can teach the kids, and Jeremy can do the youth group, and all our science school teachers can teach the kids because uh, don't have a measure of confidence. But if a person lives for Jesus and they get a measure of confidence, this is what they should do. That's a good indication of spiritual gift. Now, we can't come back to this next time because next time is pray service for Thanksgiving. And all the members that want to can talk and give testimonies. And everybody that wants to do music can do music. So far, there have been about a half a dozen sign up. And if you want to help next week, sign up on the back tables on the way out. Thank you.